All right, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about uh, the start of nations and empires. Um, I'm not going to lie; this is going to be kind of a, kind of a wild lecture. We're gonna we're gonna kind of go all over the place today. I mean, hopefully it'll all make sense and it'll, it'll follow a logical order. Um, but this is going to be kind of a wild lecture. So we're going to talk about the beginning of nations, but we're also going to talk about uh, science. We're going to talk about Darwin's ideas. Uh, but ultimately, what we're talking about today is empires. Um, in the late 1800s and early 20th century, Europe pretty much took over the world. And that would ultimately lead to World War I. Uh, the Great War, as it was known at the time, was basically a war between European empires, with basically the rest of the world paying the price for that. So today we're going to talk about how did Europe get to that point and then suck the rest of the world in. And if you're studying African history, Asian history, um, uh, Middle Eastern history, this period, which, you know, I, I think most of us in the U.S. kind of skip this period. We don't really think much about the late 1800s and early 20th century. Heck, we don't even really think about World War I much in this country. But this is going to, this is a period between, again, about 1880 to the end of World War I, although we're not going to talk about World War I today. That 40-year period completely transformed everything. So many of the nations today, like Iran and Iraq, um, pretty much started during this period. So anyway, it's, it's going to be, uh, again, a transforming period. But today we're going to talk about how to, the ideas uh, and the, the scientific discoveries that led to this. And some of this is going to be very positive, things that we still celebrate today. And a lot of it is uh, not going to be so positive. This is, this is going to get into, if you will, the dark side of science and the dark side of empires. Uh, and the reason I have this particular image up is because um, England, still to this day, England was ultimately the largest empire ever. Um, as they used to say, the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, you can get a sense of just how much, you know, England controlled of the world. You know, every continent, England controlled something there. So I want to start with kind of a, a maybe kind of a weird uh, tangent. Uh, this is H.G. Wells. I'm sure some of you have heard of him before. He uh, was a philosopher, a writer, uh, a scientific thinker, but he's probably most known for a couple of his novels, uh, The Time Machine, uh, The Invisible Man. But his his biggest work was a novel uh, written in 1899 called The War of the worlds. And the novel, and you've probably seen some version of the movie. There was a famous version in the 50s and then about 15 years ago, uh, Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise did a, a, a movie version of it. It's actually pretty good. Um, and then just recently on the BBC, and I think it played on Netflix, there was a, a new version of it. Anyway, War of the Worlds today sounds like a ridiculous idea. It's, you know, this idea that if Martians invaded the Earth, um, which, again, you know, you just look at the, I mean, to hear about Martians, is, it just seems silly today. But, but you know, in the late 1800s, that was seen as plausible. By that point, astronomy was becoming, you know, quite the fad. You, know, you had these really great telescopes. And people were looking at the moon and they were looking at Mars and on both of those places, they were appeared to be, uh, you know, evidence of structure, especially in Mars. There seemed to be what they call these canals, these straight lines going across Mars. And a lot of people thought that that was evidence of uh, some sort of intelligent life. Now, some people argued it's extinct intelligent life, but that was the argument. And people really thought that this was could be a real thing. Um, so, I mean, H.G. Wells, I don't think, actually thought that there were Martians that were going to attack us, but he took that idea, and again, he wrote sort of an allegorical novel about it. And of course, what you, if you guys know anything about it, it's probably the radio show from 1938 that a guy named Orson Wells did that made everybody panic. Um, but, the, but the novel itself is quite interesting, and what's really, I, I, you know, it's usually known as, you know, kind of an early science fiction novel. But for historians, this is really very much an allegory about two things. One about germ theory 
and the other about empires. And, and really, those two things go together. Um, so if, if, if you've ever read the novel or seen a movie version, you know that, again, these Martians attack. And apparently they've been planning this a long time. They have all their sort of weapons kind of buried deep in the earth. And then at some point they all kind of arrive through these flashes and, and they occupy these big tripod things. And these tripods, you know, lift up out of the ground and start destroying. Uh, in the novel, it's England, but in the movies, it's the whole world. They start destroying everything. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do to stop them because this is an advanced society, an advanced intelligence with this incredible technology. Uh, but then uh, they just stop. And ultimately, it's because of microbes. They had not planned for microbes and they all die of germs, basically. Um, and H.E. Wells wrote this as, a, again, as a, um, a critique of empires. First off, he, he talked about the, the connection between germs and the ability to take over. And we've talked about this even going back to the 1500s. I mean, there's a reason why most of us are not Native Americans. That's because of the impact of, of germs on Native Americans. Or there was a reason why Europe did not take over Africa in the 1500s because they couldn't survive the diseases. Uh, but the ability to take over Africa, say in 1899, which Europe was doing at that point, uh, was because they had defeated germs. So he he was seeing this connection, even though historians at that point weren't looking at that. But he was also sort of critiquing the whole idea of empire. He was he hated racism. He was for women's rights. I mean, he was very much a progressive for his time. Um, he hated nationalism and, and you know hated the idea of one race being superior to another race and. You know, and he says, you know, think about, you know, when you read the novel, you know, it, it's horrific what these Martians are doing to us. So think about what we Europeans are doing, say, to Sub-Sahara Africa or what we Europeans are doing to some of the people in the Middle East. You know, it is the same thing. You know, and um, it, it, and again, if you've seen the Spielberg version from 2004, is that was very much a post 9/11, uh, also a post Iraq War movie, um, because it, it very much feels like 9/11 when you watch the movie. But it, but it was also a critique of the Iraqi War, um, and in the same way, this is a critique of empires, and it's also a warning. Um, again, we we might defeat ourselves because we didn't think about what we're doing. And in a weird way, it kind of predicts World War I uh, because these empires would collapse, uh, you know, based on, on the fact that they were becoming too competitive and too big and they ultimately collapsed by fighting each other. So again, I'm sorry, I should, I should have switched slides a moment ago. Um, anyway, this is, of course, the famous uh, 1950s version by a guy named George Powell. It's actually quite good. It's very dated, but it's actually quite good. And then, of course, this is the Spielberg movie. Uh, but actually, I really, I thought it was fascinating. It wasn't a big hit, but I actually thought it was incredible. All right, so let's back up a little bit. Um, you know, last time we really sort of talked about kind of political history, we talked briefly about the Thirty Years' War. And, and we talked about it in regards to sort of the end of the Protestant Reformation and the, the last of the major religious wars in Europe. And the end of that war was something known as the Peace of Westphalia. And, you know, for most historians and political scientists, that 1648 is sort of seen as kind of the beginning of nations, or, or what we call the nation state. Um, instead of being kingdoms and monarchies, these are now, you know, they're beyond just a king. They, they are now, you know, a real entity with, with hard boundaries, um, you know, with, with kind of a national identity instead of saying, I'm Dave, I serve King Henry VIII. It's more like I'm Dave and I'm from England. You know, there's, there's a real sense of a national identity. Uh, and, and again, these nations exist outside of a king. Whether they have a king or not, the nation still exists. Um, and, and there is this recognition that these nations exist and they're going to basically respect each other. And um, not, you know, again, monarchies would just kind of take over other monarchies. They would stop doing that. 
this is the idea that they're going to recognize other nations. Now, this will not apply to Africa or Asia or the Americas, of course. The, those don't count as far as Europe was concerned. But, but amongst Europeans, uh, we'll still see wars, uh, but there'll be a, a very different kind of war. And these wars, like, say, the American Revolution or the Seven Years' War or um, the, you know, the, the Quasi War with the U.S. and France in the 1790s, these are wars where they're not necessarily trying to take over another country. They're usually just trying to get something out of that other country. And this idea that countries can, can self-determine, uh, where they can decide their own fates. And again, these, these are, again, they're, they're not about monarchs, but they're also not about churches. This is not, uh, we're a Catholic country, and you're a Protestant country, and we're going to take you over and force you to be our religion. These are kind of separate uh, from the religious beliefs. And this is known as the Westphalian model, and this is pretty much where we still are today. Uh, the only difference is today we recognize all the nations of the world, not just the European nations. So once you start having nations, you, a couple of things come out of this. One is an idea known as nationalism. Uh, and again, nationalism is very different from patriotism. I think some people put these two words together. Patriotism just means you love your country. You love where you're from. Nationalism is a little darker. It, it doesn't have to be, but often it is. It, it's the idea that your nation is better than everybody else's and, and everybody else um, kind of needs to be subservient to your nation. You know, I'm a, you know, a good German is a dead German. Uh, you know, I, it's, you know, I, the way I always describe it is, is there's a burning building. A nationalist would say there's two, you know, and say there's two babies in there, uh, maybe a German baby and an American baby. And, and if you're a nationalist American, you're going to save the American baby first. Uh, while other people would just save whichever baby they can get their hands on first and save that, you know, then, um, but this idea that there is something inherently different about somebody from one nation versus another. I mean, it, it, it's, in my US2 class, I describe it as cultural racism in a way. It, 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 racism is supposed to be about, you know, biological differences. This is sort of about, you know, cultural differences or, or geographical differences. It is sort of an us versus them. Um, and, and once these ideas develop, and they take, you know, a couple of centuries to truly develop, and they do sort of tie in with race and, 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 and other scientific, pseudo-scientific ideas. Uh, and this is what's going to allow for the 20th century, uh, the war that we see. Because wars is so much worse in the 20th century. You know, we think we're getting more civilized, but if you actually look at the 20th century, not so much. Um, you know, what we, we start seeing the development of something known as total war where you're not just killing soldiers, you're literally killing the other country, you know, destroying entire cities, bombing neighborhoods, and then ultimately the atomic bomb, where you literally destroy an entire city. Uh, nationalism is what allows those kinds of atrocities, what we now would call war crimes. And yes, I know I'm implementing even our own country in that, in that sentence. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what allows for those things to happen. You know, those people don't deserve to live uh, while we people do. It is, it is, there is a dark, very dark side to this. At the same time, though, uh, with the rise of nations, you also get something else that may be a little softer. And that's something known as internationalism. I mean, obviously, you have to have nations first before you can have relations between nations. This particular term uh, was coined by a, a British philosopher named Jeremy Bentham. Um, in the 1830s. He was, um, again, quite a reformer for his time. He um, lived between 1748 and 1832. Uh, he taught at the University College of London. He was one of the first major uh, academics to argue for women's rights, even argue for things like animal rights. I mean, you know, again, quite a radical for his day. Definitely pushed better uh, laws for the poor, you know, really trying to improve society. Uh, and he said, you know, we can have our nations, but we can we can relate to each other without necessarily going to war with each other. We can talk to each other. We can have treaties uh, to accomplish our goals. And, and, and in a way, nations can all accomplish their goals at the same time. You know, it used to be if this nation is powerful, that this other nation has to pay the price. And he's saying, no, no, we, we can work cooperatively. It's sort of like taking democracy 
uh, and saying we, we can do this between nations. By the way, Bentham, um, uh, not so much in the U.S., but in, in Britain and throughout much of Europe, he, he, he's a, one of these huge figures. Uh, but it's very interesting. If you go to the school at the University College of London, uh, you can actually see Jeremy Bentham today. That's because when, when in his will, he literally donated his body to the college. So you, in a cabinet, they actually have a, a dummy version of him. And at the bottom is his head. This is actually Jeremy Bentham with a couple of fake eyes in the head. The other term that was coined about 100 years later is globalism. And, and I'm very aware that for a lot of people today, both of these terms are negative terms. You hear a lot of people talk about, you know, the globalist. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of times people on the left, like, uh, you know, you know, people who support, say, Bernie Sanders are often talking about the, the evils of globalism. But Trump on the right also uh, sometimes talks about the evils of globalism. Um, and, and again, both of these terms can have a dark side, but they can also have a very positive side. So the so what both of these are doing in a way is sort of softening the boundaries between nations. You know, if you think of nationalism as sort of building walls and, and fences between nations, what internationalism is doing is sort of you know, putting gates and doors into those walls and fences. And then globalism is sort of the idea, well, maybe we don't need these fences anymore. And again, you can, you know, I, just using the term wall, at least now in 2020, I mean, it has very strong political implications for the U.S. You know, and of course, I'm recording this during the coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, nations right now are all building up walls, you know, to try to contain this virus. So in a way, right now, we're, we are kind of paying the price for globalism because, which I will admit my own bias, I'm very much an internationalist and a globalist in the way I think of the world. I, I'm a proud American, but I happen to believe personally that it's a good thing when nations work together. And, 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 but at the same time, uh, when you have a disease like coronavirus, the, yeah, it, it may not be so good traveling around everywhere and stuff. So we are kind of paying the price for that right now. Um, but I mean, some examples um, of globalism, internationalism in our world today, even though, you know, it's so funny, people get online and they complain about these, these freaking globalists ruining the world, but they're doing it on an internet. <laughs> the internet only works in a global setting because so many of the servers that you're accessing are in Russia and in China and in Canada. And, you know, the, the, we're, they're using Facebook to make these complaints and are using Google to look things up. And, and it's like, wait a minute, you're using international corporations and globalist corporations to complain about, glo you know, I, I think so many people don't really think about how much they benefit from internationalism and globalism, you know, because, again, things like Internet multinational corporations like Amazon and, and YouTube and Amazon, uh, excuse me, Google and Facebook. And as much as we complain about them, we're all using them. Uh, FIFA, which is the, you know, if you're a sports person, you know, that's the football organization, soccer, basically, uh, which pretty much everyone participates in in the entire world except the U.S. Um, the Olympics would be another example of kind of globalism, internationalism. NGOs, which means non-governmental organizations, so think Red Cross, um, you know, think other types of charities that feed people. And, 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 you know, a lot of churches would be considered this. I mean, you know, many churches are international, whether it's the Catholic Church or the Church of England or the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church. They have global reach and they have churches all over the world. And of course, free trade. And, you know, we're constantly, you know, debating about this. But, I mean, look at most of the products in your room. You're probably doing this, obviously, on a phone or on a computer. Uh, check out where that thing was made. You know, it's probably not made in the U.S. So we're all, you know, kind of feeling the, the, the positive effects of this. And there are real benefits beyond what I've mentioned. Um, you know, the whole idea of internationalism is the idea of recognizing the sovereignty uh, of other nations, which, you know, democracy, uh, you know, say when the U.S. developed democracy, you're recognizing the rights of other humans, you know, the civil rights and the human rights of people and uh, recognizing people's right to speak and right to vote. You, you take that at the global level and suddenly not only are you promoting democracy within countries, but you're also 
de promoting democracy across countries, things like the United Nations, the European Union. Um, again, when you have more markets, I mean, you know, we might complain about Amazon and stuff, but at the same time, it provides more jobs, more money, more choices to buy things. Um, again, people love to complain about, you know, oh, it's terrible, you know, how McDonald's and Walmart's taking over the world, but yet, and I'm one that sometimes does that, and yet, we, so for instance, right now, I've probably gone to Walmart three or four times in the last few days, buying food, buying supplies for this pandemic. Yeah, it's kind of nice having some choices and some cheap goods. Um, and again, one of the between countries, you know, the idea you're trying to find agreement, consensus, not making war. War is sort of the last uh, last option out there. Um, and so because you're not going to war, you obviously it's promoting peace. And, and even though we still see war in the world today, really since World War II, uh, we haven't really seen a major war. And it's really quite shocking. We're talking 75 years since the end of World War II. Uh, I mean, we're talking a couple of generations now of no major wars. And obviously we're healthier. And even with the coronavirus that's happening right now in 2020, um, we're also seeing, you know, incredible cooperation between countries to, to try to combat this. Uh, this disease would have been so much worse if it wasn't for this. And again, the toleration and justice spreads. But it's not all rosy, especially historically. Uh, there are a lot of problems and we still, and these are, I think, what a lot of people are feeling today. Sometimes I think um, people don't feel like they belong anymore. There, there is a sense of placelessness. So I think in the last you know, 10 years, we are seeing a return of nationalism in our modern society. Um, you, I, I mean, Trump, for instance, I mean, very much promoted himself as a nationalist. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it is interesting that, that we're seeing kind of a turn towards that. Um, and and you know, there, there is there, there is kind of a turn away from some of the aspects of globalism. Um, but unfortunately, with a lot of these multinational corporations stuff, we are seeing, you know, the haves and haves nots, that divide's getting much, much worse. And that is a real problem. And I think, you know, with the rise of corporations, especially once they, they go across international boundaries, a good example is Amazon. Uh, I use Amazon constantly, but at the same time, Amazon kind of doesn't pay any taxes. Because they, they, you know, they don't, they heard, they paid, I think, no U.S. taxes last year. They hardly pay any in Britain because they kind of say, well, we're not in any one country. We're all over the place. So while you and I are paying tons of taxes, a lot of these corporations are not. Um, and there is a lot of exploitation going on. There's also this idea of homogenization, this idea we're all kind of becoming the same and sort of some of the uniqueness that makes the world so uh, pleasurable and, 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 and you know, it, it's it's sort of going away. There is this kind of sameness across the world. And so some of the strands of internationalism, um, uh, we we do see, you know, it, it plays out different ways. One way it plays out is political. Um, we do see the rise of empires, which can be very negative, uh, but but we also see the rise of, of military and and but national interests. And the idea is we're starting to see because of these three areas, we're starting to see a lot of agreements between countries. Let me give you an example. A, a person I usually skip, uh, even a lot of people are really into Napoleon. Napoleon was a leader in France that, that initially came out of the French Revolution. The French Revolution, 1789, was, an, was basically their version of the American Revolution. The French people who were very poor rose up. They created this democracy. They got rid of the monarchy. Um, I mean, really kind of went almost radical with it. Uh, but ultimately it failed because they really tried to do too much too fast. And what ultimately happened was the rise of a dictator, Napoleon, who later declared himself an emperor. Uh, I mean, he was the opposite of a true internationalist. He he began to take over all of Europe, uh, and eventually his plan was to take over the entire world. And you know, and it, you can see the the reach of Napoleon, and, and his really his biggest mistake is he tried to invade Russia, the same mistake Hitler would make a hundred years over a hundred years later. Um, note to self: if you become a dictator, don't invade Russia. You're not going to win. But millions 
uh, ultimately died because of these Napoleonic Wars. And again, we Americans kind of forget about this. You know, we always talk about the War of 1812 when we beat England again. We forget that the only reason we beat England during that war is because England was fighting Napoleon at the same time. You know, we were just this distraction to this major war. I mean, basically, it was England that held uh, Napoleon in check. So once Napoleon was finally defeated in 1815, uh, the nations of Europe kind of got together, and, and that's what we mean by a Congress, just a meeting, the Congress of Vienna. They got together and said, we got to do something to make sure that doesn't ever happen again. So, uh, again, you can see in 1810, basically France controlled pretty much almost all of Europe. Uh, by 1817, it starts to look, again, a little bit more like Europe as we know it, you know, a, a bit more of true national boundaries and such. So uh, this agreement uh, became known as the Concert of Europe. Initially, it was Russia, Prussia. When you hear Prussia, um, this is not completely accurate. Just think Germany. I mean, th that's the easiest way. So Russia, Prussia, the United Kingdom, and Austria. Later, France. You know, once later, calms down, and you know it's clear Napoleon is gone. Eventually, France will join this as well. And this goal is the balance of power, and, and to try to maintain this balance of power. Don't let either anybody get too powerful. You know, if Russia starts to get too powerful, the other members will control Russia. If Russia, if Austria gets too powerful, then Russia, Prussia, and UK get together. They all kind of work together um, to kind of keep the other ones from getting too powerful. And the idea is we're going to maintain a balance of power through treaties and such, not through war. Uh, Metternich is the guy who's sort of, he's an Austrian uh, leader. He, he kind of came up with this idea. And it's sort of this period is known as the age of Metternich. The reason I, I, it ended in 1848, 1848 was a year of constant revolutions and wars throughout Europe. It, it's basically when the concept of Europe kind of broke down for a while. But even then it was relatively minor. And, you know, pretty much, even though there's gonna be some wars in there, the Crimean War, the Franco-Prussian War, really, we don't see a return of those Napoleonic Wars until World War I. Um, you know, so, you know, you had the religious wars of the 1500s, then you have this horrible 30 years war, and then we have the Napoleonic Wars. And then really most of the 19th century in Europe and most of the world was relatively calm until World War I, which was so much worse than the Napoleonic War. And then we get World War II, um, but, for about much of the 19th century, things are relatively calm. The U.S., by the way, I try not to get too much in the U.S. in this class, but the U.S. actually, they responded to the Napoleonic Wars by creating kind of our own version of internationalism, something known as the Monroe Doctrine. Um, this is, of course, named for President James Monroe. This is, this is a little bit of um, a, a controversial idea. Basically, it's internationalism because it's between the U.S. and the rest of the Americas, but it's but at the same time it's kind of an anti-international idea because we sort of erect a defense, allegorically speaking, a fence around the the Americas. Basically, the U.S. said to Europe, "Don't come here. If if you try to come here, we're going to protect any area of the Americas." Um, so that was a reaction to Napoleon. Um, and it was kind of a cooperation between the U.S. and the rest of the Americas. Although, if you go to Mexico today or Colombia, Peru, they see this as kind of America's version of imperialism. You know, who is America to decide <laughs> what happens here? Why, why do you guys get to decide this? Uh, but so even the U.S. is affected by these changes in the world. Again, the, the this, this concert of Europe really kind of comes to an end in the late 1800s. Um, again, the Crimean War, the Franco-Prussian War, but we also begin to see the rise of empires in Europe. And, and so there's, there's starting to be very intense national competition. And you start seeing these alliances develop between various nations. And of course, it's going to be that competition and those alliances that ultimately explodes in 1914 with World War I, although that's not our lecture today. And so that's political. So there's also, I, it's sort of almost ironically, the flip side, there is a, 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 a pursuit of peace. And again, ultimately, the 19th century was more peaceful than it was militaristic, even though we, you know, we do see both. This is sort of that brotherhood of man idea. Um, 
terms I, I know like terms like liberal today have very strong meanings for Americans you know that we think leftists you know if, if you're if you're not uh, on the left you, you probably think of liberal as a, a negative idea but liberal of course is is a uh, 18th century idea it comes from the word liberty this is why in college we talk about liberal arts uh, which I think a lot of people think well that just means kids go to college and they learn how to be liberals no not really liberal arts means if you're going to be a person in a free society if you're going to be an independent person you have to know the art of history uh of math of science of of literature how to write how to think you know uh how to function in the world as an independent person as a, a person at liberty so you need to learn the arts to be an independent person that's known as the liberal arts and that's really what liberal means it means a free person um so when we talk about you know liberal uh societies we're talking about democratic societies and this idea of kind of an again neoliberal is another term that that's very debated today but neoliberal internationalism is the idea of promotion of of, of democracy of, of, in nations and across nations so um by pushing for these ideas again to be a democracy you can't be a, a society that beats each other up uh, you have to recognize and, and respect other opinions and other religions and other forms of speeches uh, that, that's how democracy works so if you take those ideals and, and apply them at the international level um it's going to promote world peace and 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 again by and large that has happened 19th century and really since world war ii we have seen that today even though it's starting to break down a little bit it's still there um so to be able to maintain this you do have to have international laws and international courts you know you have to have a way to handle um disputes between nations now ultimately we'll talk about the united nations although we're not going to get that far today so to kind of look at some of these examples um you get something known as the Con Geneva Conventions. And again, the convention comes from the word covenant, which covenant just means an agreement. So these are the Geneva Agreements. And Geneva just happened to be a place where, uh, a neutral place where countries would come together and come up with these ideas. So there were a whole bunch of these agreements or conventions over the years. So the Crimean War, um, this is one of those words everybody kind of hears of but doesn't know a whole lot about. Basically what this was, um was you know in southern eastern europe you had the ottomans basically the muslim empire and it was becoming weaker and weaker um, eventually it will go away um, again think middle east today and, and southern europe places like greece and syria and obviously you know iran and iraq those places um you know Greece had already broken away from the Muslim Empire and so all of Europe was kind of like hey you know what's going to happen to this, uh, this Ottoman Empire and we everybody kind of wants a, a, a piece of that empire well Russia decided to kind of move in uh Russia and Greece started moving in on the Ottoman Empire which would make them very powerful so the other countries decided to check them again this is using Metternich's ideas hey Russia's moving a little too fast let's all move in and stop Russia from doing that so the Crimean War basically was a very brief but brutal war between Russia and Greece versus the Ottoman Empire France the UK and a place called Sardinia again just think Italy today um and again this is one of the very first wars where we actually have photographs of it um this is also the rise of modern nursing so anybody who's a nursing major this is kind of an important moment Florence Nightingale who you see in this image this is when she rose to power um but for our pur excuse me I forgot when I change slides I have to be careful because it cuts me off for a minute for our purposes Henri do not <laughs> that's how you're supposed to say it but uh this guy uh was observing the war and he was appalled at, at some of what he saw and some of the atrocities and he basically wanted to to do something to make sure that that never happened again so he came up with an idea that was eventually formed at the came formalized at the geneva conventions and that's the red cross 
he said, you know, we, we need an international organization that will go in and protect citizens. And when people are wounded, it will help them out. And we need to all recognize that when you see that flag, you don't shoot the people because they're not the combatants. They're the neutral people. But you have to have an agreement to do that. Um, so there was a, a Geneva agreement to recognize things like the Red Cross. And this is actually the, the document the, all the world leaders signed. So here are some of these conventions that, the, you know, 1864, Henri Dunant was the first one, but there were several of these. So, for instance, 1864, Red Cross, they would recognize this organization called the Red Cross, which is a, a multi-nation organization. Also, the rights of the sick and wounded. So once you're wounded, the idea is you're not going to go in and shoot everybody who's wounded. Uh, they're already you know, the idea is once they're wounded, they can't fight anymore. So there's no need to keep killing those people. And so when a nurse or a member of the Red Cross comes out to, to tend to those wounded, you won't shoot them. Um, the problem is that only applied to land. So in 1906, they, they, they added at sea to that. So if a ship puts up the red, uh, excuse me, a white flag or a Red Cross flag, you won't sink that ship anymore. Um, one of the problems is that as POWs, prisoners of war, were being taken in, they were often being tortured and not taken care of well. So in 1929, there was another agreement. Okay, these are the rules that once you take somebody as a prisoner of war, you can't do these things to them, such as torture them. Um, and then in 1949, they, they took that a little bit further, but also other... Uh, POW is a very specific uh, category. It's a soldier who's been captured. But what about just regular citizens? What if, as an army, you take over a city? How do you treat the people of that city? For instance, when Japan invaded Nanking, which in the 1930s was the capital of China, they literally, I mean, it's known as the rape of Nanking. I mean, they just went through and literally killed and raped, uh, sometimes in that order, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And so 1949 was like, you know, we're all going to agree not to do things like that anymore. Um, so today we just consider this the way you're supposed to behave. But, you know, there, there's a history to this. Um, Tsar Nicholas II, who was a very pretty much a pretty lousy leader of Russia. And we'll get into him a little bit later. He, you know, he decided he wanted to be seen as kind of a world leader. So he formed uh, this International Peace Conference. And it was held at a place called The Hague. And this is The Hague here. And so he brought together leaders from all over the world to come up with some more agreements. So we get in 1899, The Hague Conventions. Again, convention just needs an agreement. So uh, in 1899, The Hague uh, Agreement would ban certain weapons. As technology is getting better, there is this recognition that maybe some weapons shouldn't be used. Hollow point bullets, which, by the way, were used in Crimean War, air warfare, because we are getting hot air balloons and zeppelins and early versions of airplanes, but certain chemicals they wouldn't use in war. Um, this is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was very much an internationalist. For instance, he helped bring the end of the war between Russia and Japan in 1905. He won the first Nobel Peace Prize for doing that. Um, in fact, here he is working out that deal between Russia and Japan. Here's uh, again another. And then out of that came a, another Hague Agreement. So that uh, ultimately set up rules for neutral countries. So let's imagine, um, you know, Mexico and Canada go to war with each other. And the U.S. is like, hey, hey, we're not part of this war. We're going to be neutral. Um, Canada and Mexico basically would not attack us, hopefully, because they have signed this convention. During World War I, the United States would be a neutral nation uh, until the very end. World War II, we were officially a neutral nation until Pearl Harbor in 1941. Um, so this sets up the rules of how that works. And then sort of uh, 1925, there was another little addendum to this. You know, they banned some chemical weapons. You know, no pouring acid on people, for instance. Uh, but after World War One, because, for instance, there were a lot of new chemical weapons that weren't around in 1899, and they were using them in ways that they hadn't anticipated. In 1925, there were just no chemical weapons, period, uh, which is something that still holds to this day, even though countries like Russia and Syria have, um, have ignored that sometimes. Oh, well, heck, even the United States during the Vietnam War used things like Agent Orange, but we're not, we're all not supposed to do this anymore. 
so you have these kind of political strands of internationalism. You have a, a focus on peace, but also science and technology. Um, because, you know, think about the internet. The internet only works, or telephones only works if everybody is on the same system. So, you know, once these new technologies come out, you have to come up with, you know, kind of standardized rules for this. So I've mentioned world fairs before when we talked about the sewage and toilets. You know, this is the very first world fair in London. This is the Crystal Palace, which uh, was supposed to last forever. Uh, but in 1933, it unfortunately burnt down. Um, again, Statue of Liberty was designed initially for a world, world fair. The Eiffel Tower was designed for a world fair. So these world fairs would happen every few years in various cities. You know, Glasgow has one, Edinburgh has one, uh, Berlin has one, Paris has several. Um, U.S. will have its first one in 1876 in Philadelphia. Probably the, the most famous one is the New York World's Fair of 1939. Um, and again, a World's Fair would be sort of set up. This is the 1939 New York World's Fair. It's very much like Disney World. You know, you, ha you have a, a main entrance and then you would have an area where you have various pavilions where technology would be shown off. Uh, think Epcot at Disney World. And then at, so at one point, you'd have a place where all the rides are. And again, think Magic Kingdom. Um, and, and that would be a World's Fair. And again, it really was like a huge amusement park. And in fact, uh, Walt Disney's dad worked at the Columbian World's Fair in 1893. And then he went to the 33 Chicago World's Fair and the 39 New York World's Fair, which gave him the idea for Disneyland. And then in 1964, Disney developed several rides for the 64 World's Fair in New York, including uh, It's a Small World, which when that fair was over with, he transferred It's a Small World, which is an internationalist ride, by the way, what it's basically saying, we're all one world. And then uh, it's a globalist ride, in other words. And then he took that ride and, and installed it in his brand new place, Disney World, down in Florida. So world fairs have a direct lineage to Disney World. Anyway, sorry. So this is the Chicago World Fair in 33 and these incredible rides there. So, um, so at these world fairs, they're showing off. I mean, those in themselves are an international agreement. They're all going to meet, not shoot each other. Um, but they're also showing off all these new technologies and ways of communicating, like telephones and, and, and televisions and radio. Uh, you have to have agreements. So the very first international agreement dealing with transportation and communication was something known as the Rhine Commission in 1815. This was done at the same time as the uh, Concert of Europe. So the Rhine Commission, and actually has a flag, it's all about the use of the Rhine River because it's a river that runs across several nations. And, you know, to be able to use that river, you have to go from one nation to another. So they set up an agreement of how this would work. Um, so, and, and again, the Rhine Commission itself is not that important, except it's the first one of its kind, this, this international agreement. And it's like, yeah, we can do this. Um, in 1863, you know, think, you know, that's the same year as the Gettysburg Battle, um, you know, there's something known as the telegraph, something that uh, actually uh, the United States invented. A guy named Samuel Morse invented the telegraph, which is later leads to the telephone and then much later the internet. Um, so you have to come up with an agreement, you know, because there's already telegraphs going from one country to another. So you have an international telecommunications union, the ITU. It's still around today. This dictates uh, rules about television, radio, telephones, cell phones, internet. They have their own flag. Today, this is part of the United Nations, but it used to be its own little group. Uh, postal services, you know, mail. You know, I, I just ordered a book the other day and it came from England. You know, how does that work? I mean, you know, you know, so if you're in one country, like if you're in Canada and you want to mail something to Mexico, it's going to have to go through the U.S. Well, if you don't have an agreement, the U.S. could just go, well, we're just going to burn all this mail. We don't want to do any. Why, why would we help Canada out? We just burn all this. and We'll just take it and steal it. So for mail to go from one country to another, there has to be agreements. OK, we we won't destroy your mail. You know, your mail will come to our border. Our postal workers will pick up that package and we'll take it to the next border. You have to agree to all of that. And that's known as the Universal Postal Union, the UPU. 
they have their own, I love the slide, it just makes me laugh. Um, but anyway, this is their, it looks like something, you know, my kid would draw. Uh, but anyway, this is their flag. Today, it's part of the, um, again, also part of the United Nations. So we have all these incredible uh, scientific discoveries, you know, that out there. But there is a dark side to all of this, you know. So for one thing, um, like with toilets, which we've talked about already, you know, once you start getting things like telephones, electricity, cars, airplanes, highways, you know, uh, radio movies, the, it starts to kind of change how people look at the world. You know, for instance, the West, think Europe and the United States, starts to divide the world up between the civilized and the barbaric. You know, so the civilized would be Europe, U.S., and their colonies. And then you would have the barbarians, you know, that would be people who are partially civilized, like China, the Ottomans, again, think Muslims, Northern Africa. And then you have what the West will call the savages, the really primitive people, Sub-Sahara Africa, the Pacific Islands, Native Americans, they would be considered savages. And again, like, like other things, once you name something, it, be, it changes. And once you label a group savage, you quit, re, you know, international ideas go away. They're like, they're just savages. We do whatever we want to them. And, and again, science, this is coming out of science, the ideas of, of human development. You know, anthropologists are coming up with these ideas that then get applied to, um, to political ideas. So this is um, a, a cartoon shown in the United States, you know, quote unquote, helping the rest of the world. So the white man's burden, which is a phrase that comes from the English uh, writer Rudyard Kipling, who also wrote The Jungle Book. Uh, the United States in 1898 fought the Spanish-American War, and out of that, we got Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines. Basically, we got colonies, and Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem saying, finally, the United States has picked up the white man's burden. You know, this is kind of like when a parent says, you know, they, after they spank you, they say, oh, that hurt me more than it hurt you. This is for your own good. And you're like, no, it wasn't. That hurt. Uh, that's sort of this. It's like, we're going to take you over, but it's for your own good. And so you can see, you know, the, the poor England and poor United States carrying these children uh, from places like, as you can see, Cuba, Puerto Rico. Notice, they're, it's interesting, notice they're drawn as stereotypical African-Americans because that's how people thought, you know, African-Americans were seen as the lowest of the races you know, at this time. So, you know, these Cubans are like Africans, you know, they're savages. And England, of course, has all the Asians, the Middle Eastern people, and they're carrying them from savagery and barbarism up to civilization at the top of this rock hill. And this is like Sisyphus rolling the rock up the hill across ignorance and vice and brutality and slavery. It's not a very good view of the other peoples of the world, is it? You know, and this is the white man's burden to do this. Um, and again, these ideas are coming out of ideas uh, that we now call evolution or human origins. Um, and, and so let's get into some of those ideas a little bit. So uh, so this dark side of science, you know, basically all these incredible agreements that I talked about didn't apply to savages, which is why we continue to see empires taking over. Um, and, and I think what sealed this idea, the same year as the Spanish-American War in the U.S., uh, we see another war uh, involving England in, in the, what is now the nation of Sudan, the Battle of Omdurman. Um, this is a battle um, that actually also influenced H.G. Wells, um, showing the superiority, supposed to be showing the superiority of the West over these savages and barbarians. So this was a battle. Uh, that took place in the Sudan um, between 52,000 Sudanese versus 8,000 British soldiers. Now, some of those British soldiers were actually Egyptians, but they were part of Britain. Um, 17,000 Sud Sudanese were killed, 13,000 were wounded, and 5,000 taken as POWs, while Britain, who won the battle, again, with only 8,000 soldiers, uh, had 100, uh, excuse me, had 47 killed and 380 wounded. And, you know, so again, 8,000 versus 52,000, but because Britain had modern technology, uh, they were able to overwhelm. And again, like the Martians overwhelming 
earth, if you will. I mean, that's this is directly influenced. A lot of people said, see, that's why the West is so superior. But other people were actually appalled at this. That again, this this is maybe instead of taking over these people, why not help them out? I mean, that becomes part of the debate. All right, so that was all kind of build up to getting into something known as new imperialism. So Darwin germs and the scramble for Africa. So what do we mean by new imperialism? Um, again, this is a period that starts in the 1880s and goes all the way to World War I. So what's so new about it? Well, in the 1500s, you had, after Columbus, you had Spain and England and France and Portugal and Holland all scrambling to take over the United States. Well, that's all done with now. The United States is all countries now. It's all nations. And so now Europe is looking for somewhere else to conquer, and it happens to be Africa. Africa is kind of this wild place, supposed to be full of barbarians and savages, so no rules about that. So there was this kind of wild chase to conquer Africa. And another thing that made it new was this use of science to do this. And another thing is that the argument was kind of like in the 1500s is that, you know, the nation has problems, you're overpopulated, you have people you don't like, whatever, you can export those social problems to these colonies. Um, but sort of like in the 1500s, but much more intense, you start getting these major rivalries that begins to break down that concert of Europe. Um, again, we start seeing this in the late 1800s as these competitions become more and more intense, again, exploding into World War I. But I think the part that, other than science, the part that makes this the most new and different is this use of biology to justify this. And again, we're looking at nationalism, which is very much tied with race. And you know that there are biological differences between one group of people and the other. And maybe those biological differences are so great that all rules are out the window. You know, that it's, it may be a sin for an English person to kill a French person, but in their minds, it may not be a sin to kill a savage. So that's where, you know, and again, ultimately, I mean, the, the worst example of this, of course, is the Nazis in World War II with the Holocaust. I mean, that's kind of where all of this is ultimately going to lead. And of course, all of this is what's going to lead to what was at that time the, the worst war in human history, where over 10 million people were killed. Of course, 20 years later, you get an even worse war, and that's World War II, but not yet. Let's talk a little bit about this new imperialism. And, and, and again, kind of like with H.G. Wells, let me kind of talk about it in sort of a weird way. Uh, I don't know how many of you were Boy Scouts or even Girl Scouts. Um, if you were, you started uh, something that was begun by Robert Baden Powell. He was uh, in the British military, and if you you know if you think of Boy Scout uniforms, uh, they basically are based on the military uniforms of that day. Now today, military looks very different. Boy Scouts still look the same, uh, but they are basically uh, military uniforms, and. Um, it, to me, they look like National Park Service Rangers, but National Park Service Rangers uh, originally basically were military guys. You know, again, that's why they look like that, the smoky bear hat, if you will. So Powell was uh, concerned about what he saw was happening in society. England was becoming a great empire, which he supported. But to maintain an empire, you need um, soldiers. You need men who are able to fight and survive in the world. And he's thought that English society was becoming too weak, uh, in his mind, to feminize. These men were working in factories now, working in offices. They weren't real men anymore. And he needed, he thought, to prepare the, the male youth of Britain to, you know, so they don't lose their place in society. They needed a, an organization, you know, basically a cult of masculinity, you know, to, to get these young British kids in touch with their masculinity. Um, and so this was about promoting nationalism, promoting imperialism in kids. He based his imagery, you know, the, 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 the names that use in scouts, the scout guidebooks, uh, the publications, very much based this on the American cowboy. Uh, the frontiersmen, if you will, 
um, you know, for Britain, they love the West and they say, yeah, we need to be like those cowboys. We need to get back in touch with our, our frontiersman side. Uh, his wife, by the way, went on to, to create, uh, the Girl Scouts. Uh, his wife, by the way, was 55 years younger than him. <laughs> she was 23 when they married. He was in, uh, his seventies by that point. But anyway, they, she helped start the Girl Scouts, uh, which in Britain is known as Girl Guides. Um, and then they both came to the United States uh, and started the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts here in the U.S. as well. Um, he eventually died in 1910. Um, but again, you may not have realized that the Boy Scouts were very much coming out of imperialism. By the way, he also, the other reason Powell did this is he really, really didn't like the idea of women getting the vote. There was a suffrage movement for women. Suffrage means the vote. Um, and he definitely didn't like this. So the scouts were supposed to restore male superiority in society. Uh, he thought that women trying to vote was, in his words, quote, silly. Um, so again, the, the scouts have kind of a, a little bit different history than we give them today. Uh, oh, the, sorry, this is some of the other publications of the Scouts from Britain. And again, see, you, know, you got this young boy, one day I'm going to rule the world, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and, and teaching traditional male values and traditional female values. Women are there to support the men, all of that. And some of what Powell's getting his ideas from is actually an American historian named Frederick Jackson Turner. Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, he's very, very rarely talked about today. That Frederick Jackson Turner is considered one of the first major modern historians. And he was an American, and, and by the late 1800s, there was this sense that America was unique. There was America exceptionalism. And Turner was really curious, like, what makes us, us Americans different from the rest of the world? Why are we exceptional? And he came up with an idea that he premiered at a World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. It's known as Turner's Thesis, also known as the Frontier Thesis. Um, it's interesting, at that World's Fair in Chicago, uh, the most popular attraction was not in the fair, but was actually just outside of the fair. Buffalo Bill Cody, a former cowboy, put on a stage show, uh, basically kind of like a, a, a play and a rodeo put together. He had actual Native Americans like Sitting Bull and other cowboys and Annie Oakley, and they would put on fake gun shows and capture buffalo and all that. And it was the most popular thing going. It was millions, literally millions went to see this. And it was, and the reason it was so popular was because it was about something that was gone. And that's the frontier. Frontier is, you know, kind of a, one definition of it is that line between civilization and wild, you know. And the frontier can be anywhere. I mean, you know, but Frederick Jackson Turner argued that the frontier is what made us different. The fact that we had an area that was unsettled. So as the states get bigger and more populated, we always had a place to move to. It's like a safety valve. It's like having, like you live in a house and you get crowded. We well, have other rooms that you can move into. You have more kids. Okay, put them in the other rooms. But in 1890, the census for the U.S. showed that there was no more frontier. All the frontier was settled, which is already, which is interesting in itself that there is no more frontier. The frontier is gone. So Frederick Jackson Turner, not only was he saying the frontier is what made us different because Europe doesn't have a frontier. You know, but what made us different is this frontier, but now it's gone. So it's also kind of a warning, he was saying, are we going to get old and decayed and start to fall apart? Is this the end of American exceptionalism or do we need to keep going? That would be an empire. And the answer turned out to be yes. In fact, a few years after this, we, the Spanish-American War. And of course, when John Kennedy uh, was president, he talked about going to a new frontier, the moon. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know, it, the beginning of the movies and the TV show always starts out the same way. You hear Captain Kirk go, space, the final frontier. That's Richard Jackson Turner that they're doing. Um, so this, his ideas became incredibly influential throughout the world, this need for an empire, because the empire is your frontier. It's your safety valve. It's your ability to keep growing. The new frontier, uh, not for the U.S., but for everybody else, was that Africa. 
this was going to be the new frontier. And as you can see, at the start of World War I, pretty much all of Africa, except for one place, was entirely controlled. Actually, excuse me, two places. Entirely controlled by Europe. I always forget about Liberia. Liberia was a small country on the West Coast that was founded by former slaves and Americans, actually. Uh, it was a place for liberty for slaves, but it was very tiny. Uh, but the, the main place was Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia that, that they were the only part of Africa that was not taken over. They would remain independent until 1935 when Italy invades them uh, during World War II. Uh, but the rest of Africa was completely owned by either Italy or Spain or Belgium or Germany or Britain or France or Portugal. You know, they completely, you know, over about a 40 year period, took over all of Africa. So that's why we call it the scramble for Africa. But to be able to do that, because there's a reason Afri Africa was not colonized in the 15 and 1600s because of diseases and technology. You know, Africa used to be, as you might remember, a place of major empires. Well, because of slavery, those empires are now gone, but they still have diseases. So to be able to take over Africa, you have to conquer those diseases. And you, you have to do that through the microscope and through medicine. So as one person said, the future of empire lay with the microscope. So medical history you know, really explodes in the 19th century. Uh, at the beginning of the century, in the early 1800s, it was actually Edinburgh. Uh, in Scotland, that was really the leaders in medical practices. They would have these theaters where you'd have, you know, these bodies that would then be uh, torn apart so people could look inside the body because you forget that uh, you couldn't before x-rays and, and stuff, you couldn't see what was inside a body without killing the person. Um, you know, it was this big mystery. What's inside of us? Uh, in the 1800s, that was kind of a frontier in itself. Let's, let's dig into a body and see what it looks like and how does it actually function? So to have good medical knowledge you had to have a lot of bodies even today doctors it is still a big deal to, to the first time you dissect a human body and it's kind of a rite of passage for doctors there's a book that came out recently it was full of these photos it was very typical even today that first time you have your body that you're going to dissect you take a photo of yourself with it so here are some various photos of people with their first bodies that they're dissecting and in fact, in Edinburgh, one of the most famous doctors was a guy named Henry Knox, who uh, needed bodies to, to hold classes. So he would pay grave robbers, people like uh, these two guys named Burke and Hare, first off to dig up graves to get the bodies. But then eventually Burke and Hare just started murdering people. They were the first serial killers. Uh, they started murdering people and selling them to Henry Knox, who knew all about it. Uh, in my Scotland program, this is this is one of my favorite stories to tell is the story of Burke and Hare and Henry Knox. Um, but Henry Knox, again, you know, this was his practice, but the bodies he was dissecting uh, when he trained students were bodies of murdered people. Eventually they were caught and hung in the middle of Edinburgh. Uh, that's one example of the dark side of science. Um, and in fact, you may know uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, who's from Edinburgh. He wrote several novels, uh, including a short story called The Body Snatcher, which was about that story. But you also might know the story of Jekyll and Hyde, um, which takes place in London, but it's really about Edinburgh. And uh, it's partly about Burke and Hare and, 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 and the basically the first mad scientist. Dr. Jekyll is the first of the crazy mad scientists who will do anything. And that's based on Henry Knox. Henry Knox was a scientist that was willing to murder people to, to keep science going. And I think of how many movies, including like Dr. Frankenstein, that's all about who cares whether people live or die. It's all about science. I mean, Robert Louis Stevenson invented that idea. But this novel is also about chemistry. And it's also about uh, the implications of science. Um, you know, in the 1800s, uh, scientists and chemists were coming up with new chemicals to, to drink or, or breathe in that might make you not feel pain or you know, things like laughing gas or chloroform, but it could also maybe change you. And if you think about the story of Jekyll and Hyde, it's about Dr. Jekyll who drinks a potion and becomes this primitive person. This is also, again, based on ideas of savagery versus civilized, that deep inside of all of us, we still have that savage and the right chemical might bring that savage out. So all of these ideas of science are coming through this one novel, which I do highly recommend. Uh, it's a short novel. It doesn't take long to read. Um, 
but this idea of, of the implications of chemistry, and we'll see this. So um, the Napoleonic Wars happen, and then they go away, and things are peace, and then Crimean War explodes, and then it goes away. The next really big war was the Franco-Prussian War. Again, think France, Germany. Um, this was uh, a war that resulted in a couple of things. When it kind of changed the power structure of Europe, uh, you know, basically it's, it, Germany emerges as the big power. And if you think of World War One and World War Two, it's basically the world versus Germany twice. Um, as the comedian Norm Macdonald uh, said one time, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It's the entire world versus Germany. And it was close, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Germany almost won. Uh, and th their rise to power started with this war. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is what really comes out of this war. It's not the war itself, but kind of the implications, if you will, of this war. Because it was during this war that uh, you really see the impact of science on military victory. So uh, we've mentioned before, there's this idea of germ theory, this idea that maybe there are these microbes that, that make us sick. And if, when, if we can identify those microbes, then we can stop diseases. I mean, that's what we're trying to do right now with the coronavirus, right? So Louis Pasteur, uh, you probably know the word more than anything because pasteurized milk, right? That just means they heat the milk up so that uh, it kills all the microbes in it. Um, and then that, that way you can drink milk for you know weeks without going sick, you know. Um, anyway, there used to be, you know, this idea of you put like liquid in a jar and you and you close it up and you set the jar on the shelf. You come back a few weeks later and it's green. There's algae in it. There's little bugs in it. And people are like, how did that happen? And they think, well, it's spontaneous generation. That it just happens. And he was like, there's no way that can happen. He said there there has to be little microorganisms that it's already in the water. We just don't see them. And of course, we know he was absolutely right. So he's talking about these kinds of ideas. Well. In Germany, you have Robert Koch, um, and he actually, you know, and during the Franco-Prussian War, he was sponsored by the government because they recognized that one of the limitations of war is people getting sick from diseases. If we can conquer those diseases, we can beat anybody. And so uh, Robert Koch was, again, sponsored by the government to um, takes these ideas of this Frenchman Pasteur and, and start really identifying these microbes. And he identifies cholera, uh, tuberculosis, anthrax. And once you identify them, then you can start to come up with vaccinations for them. And again, here's, uh, here's cholera, for instance. So during this war, suddenly there was this scientific race, this kind of germ race. So, so France starts to fund Pasteur to beat Coke. Um, and so between the two of them, they're coming up with all these new ways to create vaccines and, and, and to save vaccines. And so they have, they're, they're doing vaccines for anthrax, for instance. And once you have these vaccinations, that then allows you to start taking over places like Africa and Asia, because now the diseases are no longer a barrier. So let's talk a little bit about science in the 19th century. So there are a couple of real debates going on in science at this point, and all of these eventually are going to affect empires. Um, one is the transmutation of species. That's just a big fancy word for, you know, how does one animal change into another animal over time? In other words, you know, how do we get species? Um, also the idea, can animals go extinct? Um, and then finally, how old is the earth? And again, this kind of ties back in with the scientific revolution when, you know, the earth was seen as 6,000 years old, everything created by God, and if it's all created by God, it, it, only God can get rid of something. And so these have kind of religious implications, um, but they also are going to have racial and nationalist implications as well. So, for instance, another Scottish guy, James Hutton, uh, comes up. Uh, basically with the idea that the earth itself is much older than we thought because he starts looking at geology and how rocks form and volcanoes and he says you know these processes happen over thousands and even millions of years so, so the earth is so much older than we thought you know and so he's kind of transforming ideas about how old the earth is but we're also begin, and then you got Charles Lyell that's taking Hutton's ideas and saying, yeah, you're, he's right. He's absolutely right with this. And I can prove it now 
Um, and I'm going to skip William Smith. I should have taken him out. He basically he does this. He he shows how England builds up uh, ge geologically. So yeah, England itself is very very old. Something else that starts happening as they're starting to dig in these rocks to try to figure out what's going on, they're also finding basically what we call fossils, you know, you know, bone that have rotted away and then been filled in with minerals, and they're basically a perfect cast of the bone, and that's what we call a fossil. And they're going, wait a minute, these are animals we don't know about. These are animals that are now extinct that used to be here. And England's a great place for fossils because the ocean's eroding these cliffs, and it is quite incredible what you can find. So early 1800s becomes this huge uh, time period of looking for fossils. One of the best places, and I actually have been there with my wife, is this place right here. It's called Lyme Regis. If you're a fan of Jane Austen's, a lot of her stories end up taking place in Lyme Regis. There's several stories where they're, they're, the, the, the heroines show up in this town for a while. Um, sorry, this is from my vacation photo. Uh, just I, I stayed at that end. Uh, but anyway, the fossils here are, are quite Incredible. And a woman who lived in Lyme Regis was a woman named Mary Anning. You may know that tongue twister. She sold seashells by the seashore. I forgot the rest of it. That's Mary Anning. Mary Anning was just a regular person. Her and her dad owned a little shell shop by the seashore in Lyme Regis. And she would go out every day looking for shells, but she also started finding fossils. And then she started training herself. Uh, about fossils. She started reading uh, scientific literature and she became quite knowledgeable and, and began to identify a, a lot of species, uh, extinct species. Um, you know, like for instance, this was one that, uh, that she called basically the fish lizard. She she identified this when she was 12. Uh, the pliosaur, which uh, some people think if there is a Loch Ness monster, it actually would be this. She identified this animal. Um, and in fact, this is one of the ones she dug up. Uh, this is at the American, uh, the, excuse me, the British Museum of Natural History. And I remember taking students here years ago. And if you look at the skull, you can't see it in this image, but if you go up to it and you look at the skull, you'll see these cut marks by knives because scientists, when she presented this, they said, this is fake. And they were cutting it to see the concrete of the plaster. And they realized, no, this is actually real. But she didn't get credit for any of this until the 20th century. It, you know, men took credit for this, but it's only in the last 50 years that people went, wait a minute, Mary Anning actually discovered all of this. But this was, again, this is what the creature would have looked like you know, when it was alive. But you know, these are animals that nobody knew about. And suddenly it's like there's this whole other part of our history that we knew nothing about. And, and now we're, it's like this ancient frontier, if, if you will. Uh, by the way, this is, I, I know we're not in class, you know, together. Otherwise, I, I, I ask you, what do you guys think this is? Um, and, and, and it's really quite cool. It, it's actually from a squid. And this is the ink sack of a squid. And in fact, they've actually been able um, to, to go into some of these and they're not completely fossilized and they've actually been able to take out ink from these ink sacks from ancient squids. I always thought that was really cool. Um, and so they're starting to be, you know, with these fossils starting to people are like, okay, well, obviously animals have to have changed over time. We have evidence that they used to be different. So a, a Frenchman named Lamarck said, well, what happens is, is as their behavior changes, they, their body changes. So for instance, his classic example is the giraffe. He says, giraffes had short necks. We know that from fossils. So what happens is uh, as they stretch their necks to eat, their kids have longer necks. And then they stretch their necks to eat, then they have longer necks. Today, we know that Lamarckian evolution is, is bonkers. It doesn't work. So it'd be like if I cut my hand off and then I have sex with my wife and she has a kid, is my kid going to be born with one hand? No, of course not. Your behavior doesn't change your DNA. Of course, they didn't know about DNA yet. Uh, but that was one idea that was out there. Um, so this idea of, of what used to live, why aren't they still here? How did they change? People like Gideon Mantle, he discovered, actually his wife did it, uh, discovered this tooth that later they realized was part of an animal called the Iguanodon that we think would have looked like this. And then you had a guy named William Buckland. Buckland was an English scientist that wanted to prove that the flood, Noah's flood, clearly happened. And um, that's what killed all these animals. And so and he, he thought that these dinosaurs, there was no way they were real. So he started looking in caves and stuff. And he, he 
first off, did find found no evidence of the flood, but what he ended up finding was lots of evidence for something we now call dinosaurs. So he said, you know, he didn't want to be. He was one of the fathers of dinosaurs. Um, if, for instance, he found uh, evidence of something we now call the Megalosaurus. And this is uh, kind of like a T-Rex, basically. This is one. This is one of my favorite fossils, the, the one on the bottom there. This was first discovered in 1676. Uh, they weren't sure what it was. Then in 1763, a scientist said, "Oh well, this is clearly a fossilized scrotum from a big giant." <laughs> of course, obviously, if you know anything about, if you take an anatomy and physiology, it, it's obviously a joint, and basically it's a knee joint for a megalosaurus. But <laughs> now I can't see it any other way but as a big giant scrotum. But Richard Owen is uh, really the guy who. It's, he basically is the guy who named dinosaurs. Now, the way they put these dinosaur fossils together, we know is wrong. Uh, they kind of have the legs kind of bowed out a little bit. And this idea that dinosaurs were very slow moving and, and very cumbersome. We now know that, that, that it's, it's just the opposite. They were actually very fast moving. They were probably warm blooded with hollow bones, more like birds. And they were very, again, would have been very fast. But still, Richard Owen's the first one to say, look, all these things that people are finding, these are part of a different kingdom of animals that, that no longer exists. And in this publication, you can see at the bottom of the first paragraph, he proposes the word dinosauria, basically dinosaurs. He's the one, terrible lizards. He's the one that actually uh, names this. And, and, and we still use the term dinosaur today. And a guy named Benjamin Hawkins worked with Richard Owens to create uh, reconstructions of what these things would look like. So at the 1851 World's Fair, we can't get away from it, uh, that was the premiere of dinosaurs. And so these, there still exist today, these big structures were built to show people uh, what dinosaurs might have looked like. And so as far as the public was concerned, this is the first time they saw dinosaurs. And again, this idea that the Earth used to be very different and there were these primitive animals. And of course, that's going to get people thinking about humans as well. Did we used to be different? And again, that ties in later becomes ideas like savages and barbarians and civilized. Uh, by the way, one of the dinosaurs, it was so big that they actually had a tiny little restaurant inside of it, just to give you a sense of how big these dinosaurs were. And get some more of these kind of drawings of what dinosaurs might look like. We don't, we know they look quite different today, but this is what they thought they might have looked like. What's really neat today is uh, that not only do we have the bones, but but actually there's been skin preserved. And actually, if you go to the museum in, in, in New York, the Natural History Museum there, they actually have a dinosaur that's actually been preserved. It's, it's all crushed, but you actually see a dinosaur crushed and you can still see its skin. I mean, you know, so we have a much better idea what these things look like today. Um, and you got a few more of those old structures. All right. So how does this, you know, so we have these dinosaurs, but we don't have them today. What happened? And, and, and you know, did we change as well? So let's talk about this guy. This guy was, uh, his grandfather was a guy named Erasmus, who was a, a, a great thinker. Uh, his family did a lot of, uh, made money through uh, ceramics. Um, but he wanted to be, a, this guy wanted to be a naturalist. And that's basically, today we would call him a biologist. So he went to the University College of London, same college as Bentham. And then he got hired to work on a ship called the HMS Beagle. He was going to be the naturalist for this ship. The ship was on a five-year mission to sail all over the world, discover new plants and animals to make money from. And they needed a naturalist to help them out. So one of the places they went to was the Galapagos Islands, these volcanic islands, uh, about 800 miles off the coast of Ecuador. And these islands have animals that just aren't found anywhere else, like these giant tortoises. Uh, they're known as Galapagos tortoises. Uh, they have these finches. They have these very specific beaks. And we, it, and, and we know through the fossils that they all used to have the same beak, but by the 1800s, they had, depending on where you found the finch, if the finch was way up high, they'd have this kind of beak. If they were found very low, they'd have that kind of beak. And these beaks were perfect for digging into the rock and eating specific insects. So what made these beaks change over time? Uh, and of course, Galapagos Islands also had these 
these lizards that swim in the ocean, the only lizards, only reptiles that swim in the ocean like this, these Galapagos reptiles. So this naturalist took samples of all of these, basically killed them and stuffed them in a jar and took them back home to London, to his house south of London. And there he studied these, these specimens. He also studied moss and he studied earthworms. And he came up with some ideas about how this might work. And of course, we're talking about Charles Darwin and his ideas that we call natural selection. And I'm not getting too much into it, but, but basically the ability to find food and the ability to reproduce allows you to pass on your genes. And if, if you have traits that help you to eat and reproduce, you're going to pass on your genes. If you don't, uh, your genes don't get passed on. So nature kind of selects what, you know, which genes uh, get passed on. And he also pointed out that, you know, when things reproduce, it, natural mutations and changes, randomness occurs. And sometimes those random changes are beneficial and they get passed on and sometimes they don't. And over time, slowly, one animal might kind of change into another kind of species. And again, it's highly, de I mean, for scientists, it's not debated, but I know amongst other people, this is still a very controversial idea. And it was somewhat controversial at the time. He initially only looked at animals, but he was hinting that, well, humans would have gone through the same process. And in fact, later he wrote a book called Apes and Men, where he does say, look, you know, apes and humans probably have the same ancestor. And today, using DNA, that's pretty much what we believe. Um, that was controversial. Uh, but it also kind of tied into this idea that maybe you know, there was a primitive stage, a savage stage in human evolution that later became civilized. And maybe there are people in the world today that have not evolved all the way. Now, we don't think that now, but in the 1800s, people go, well, yeah, those, those people in sub-Saharan Africa, they haven't evolved all the way. That's why we enslaved them in America, because they're not, you know, that's, you can see how he, he didn't mean these ideas to come out, but that's how his, his ideas were then being used in, in racial sense. Um, so the ideas of empire get tied in with Darwin's ideas, his ideas of stages of humans. So if you have civilized people, you can't take them over. But if they're just savages, then you're OK to take them over. It's the white man's burden to do that. Right. Um, biology. It's funny. I, I, I not to get too, you know, judgmental here, but, you know, it is funny that a lot of biology majors are like, oh, yeah, I don't believe in evolution. I'm like, uh, you're in the wrong field because. Uh, the science of biology is entirely based on Darwin's ideas. I mean, it does create the science of biology. Um, and, you know, a lot of medicine, even computer viruses use Darwinian ideas to explain how viruses in a computer will change over time. Um, but it also leads to some really ugly stuff, something called eugenics, which I'm going to explain in just a moment, and later something known as social Darwinism, um, which, uh, which is going to lead to things like the Nazis. So Darwin um, published uh, his book, Origins of the Species, in 1859. Um, his rival was a guy named Herbert Spencer. Uh, Herbert Spencer also publishes soon after that. He's the one that coined the term uh, evolution. Darwin never used that term. Evolution is this guy's term. Herbert Spencer also came up with an idea that we now call social Darwinism. So what what Darwin was talking about was how species compete with each other. So Spencer said, well, I guess humans compete with each other as well. And, you know, and it's survival of the fittest, which is, again, a Spencer term. So this is a good example. You have John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest people ever. You have a homeless person and you have Sitting Bull, a, a Native American. So a social Darwinist would say uh, John D. Rockefeller uh, was born in Orpha, but yet he grows up to be one of the richest people in the world. Clearly, he's smart. He, he was hardworking. He, he, you know, he did it himself. That homeless person completely wasted, you know, that they had the same chances in life. And like the homeless person is just must be lazy. There's something wrong with them. Maybe he's a drug addict, but there's something about him that's inferior. And then you have a Native American. Native Americans were here for 15,000 years. They never invented the wheel, which is true, by the way. Uh, they didn't need one, but they didn't invent one. And they didn't come and conquer Europe. Europeans conquered them. So yes, you might feel bad for them, but you shouldn't. Because this is just this is just nature. This is just survival of the fittest. Now, by the way, we don't think that way anymore. Um, yes, Darwin, uh, excuse me, John D. Rockefeller um, was very smart and he did work hard. 
Uh, but he also made sure that nobody else could do it. He was also known as John the Eureka Fellow. He, he basically made sure that once he became powerful that nobody else could reach power. And again, we know lots of homeless people that maybe do have a problem, but then they clean themselves up and they're suddenly not homeless anymore and become quite productive members of society. And again, the only reason Native Americans were conquered is not because they were inferior. It was because of diseases. We know that today. Um, so again, we you have to be careful when you hear ideas like this. You have to look at context. But in the 1800s, this was kind of, this is going to be ideas that are going to justify empires. And then Francis Galton, he's really kind of a fascinating guy. He was a cousin of, uh, of Darwin, actually. Uh, he invented modern meteorology. He invented the idea of using fingerprints and criminology. Uh, he invented the idea of using mugshots. This is not a mugshot, though. He also came up with this idea that we call eugenics. And eugenics means good origins. And so his argument was, obviously, some people in the world are very successful and other people are not. Maybe we could look at their physiology and figure out maybe there are certain genes that are better than others. And maybe by looking at people's noses and hair and skin color and eyes and then looking at what kind of life they lead, we can, we can combine these two and figure out that all oh, people with this kind of nose must be smart people which today is, is absolutely ridiculous but at the time this was real science so for instance he started looking at people in southwest africa known as the nama peoples and these are and they're still around today these are some modern day images of um here's another mother and child and the Herero people, which is a people that live, another culture that lives in the same area. And so he began looking at these people and how they lived and, and, and what technology they had. And, and to him, they were savages. They weren't real people in, in a modern sense. So he ended up writing a book, uh, kind of jokingly called Can't Say Where, um, that he explores these ideas and uh, that, that, you know, saying, look, some, pe some groups of people have good genes and others do not. And so again, he comes up with this idea that of eugenics called good origins. Today, it's considered a pseudoscience. Uh, but for Galton, and by the way, H.G. Wells was a big believer in this. Um, although he said humans weren't ready for this yet. Um, but it's a pseudoscience. It's a way to improve human society by trying to identify those good genes and getting rid of the bad genes, which is going to be one of the core justifications for empires. So what you see he happening here is people looking at the shape of people's skulls to try to decide. Um, so basically what you do, let me go back up. So what you would do is you would take a group of people and you would go, okay, here are some criminals and here are some really smart people and really good people. Um, let, let, let's look at their lives and what kind of life they live. And now let's look at their eyes and their noses and their ears and their hair. And we're going to try to make connections between the two. Again, it, it, this is bad science, but that was the idea. And so not surprisingly, people like Galton said, OK, well, white people are smarter. Black people are not. Um, Native Americans are at the bottom. Asians are closer to the top. Not taking into account anything to do with context. And for instance, not paying attention to the fact that Africa used to have these major empires where Europe could be quite primitive at times. You know, he doesn't take any of that into consideration. It's this idea that like evolution, everything is always moving forward and that some of us are, are ahead of the game and others are way behind. So IQ tests were supposed to be a way to do this. For instance, immigrants to the U.S. would be given an IQ test. And, uh, and they were incredibly biased, culturally biased. So, you know, you're supposed to figure out like in these images, uh, you know, like, like that clock, where does that clock fit in? Oh, it fits in there because obviously it hangs on the wall and they're eating breakfast and they're getting ready for school. But what if you come from society like the Nama people who don't have clocks? That doesn't mean you're not smart. You just don't know what a clock is. So you can get a sense of how culturally biased these could be, but these were used to make real decisions. Like for in the US, we made policy on immigration based on M IQ tests. Um, and again, the Nazis would, it's always end up going back to them, doesn't it? But they would take these ideas and run with them. That was their justification of wiping out the Jews. They said Jewish peoples are inferior and they have bad genes. So we need to wipe them out to improve human evolution. And so Galton's goal was to have documents like this. So you can see this is for African-Americans. Criminals who are African-Americans have shorter, broader heads, lighter skin color, more woolly, less frizzy hair. I mean, 
again, this is just comedy almost if it wasn't real. But think about Disney movies. Think about you watch a lot of Disney movies. The villains in them look like villains, don't they? They're always a little darker skinned, aren't they? Um, it is interesting that these ideas kind of still play out in society. And of course, the next step. Uh, if you believe this stuff is to maybe start sterilizing people. You know, if you really think certain genes are bad, maybe keep people from passing on those genes. And in some states, not Georgia or Florida, but some states actually pass laws to do this. And, you know, thousands of people, even in the U.S., were actually sterilized. In South Carolina, they did it all the way up until the early 70s. Mostly people in prisons, uh, unwed mothers would often be sterilized, their ovaries would be taken out, and people in state hospitals would do this. But um, this is where they were heading. Uh, eventually, this stops in the U.S., and these ideas head over to Germany. Um, so, you know, the ideas of Darwin could also lead to hoaxes. Um, in this area of a pilt down England, uh, some road workers, uh, apparently dug up a skull and they took they took it to a local guy named Charles Dawson um, and it was known as the Piltdown Man and it seemed to be kind of like an ape-like skull with a really giant brain. So throughout the 1800s they were finding evidence of human origins. They were finding all these skulls, uh, things that we now call Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Australopithecines. They were all being found in Asia and Africa, which made white Europeans very uncomfortable. They didn't like the idea that they were related to Africans. But these also all had very small brains. Well, this was found in Europe, in England, and they thought, oh, here we are. We're not related to those Africans. We're unique. And look, we got a big brain. We're really smart. We've always been smart. That's why we're evolutionarily better. It's a hoax. It's one of the most famous hoaxes of all time. It, and it's a bad hoax. First off, they're not fossils. They're bone. That, that's a giveaway right there. Uh, it's a human skull with a, chap, a, chap, I can't even talk, a, a, a chimpanzee jaw attached to it. And then they poured tea on it to make it look old. Uh, it's a, then they buried it in the ground. We don't know who did it. It wasn't Charles Dawson. We know that. Um, he was kind of a victim of this hoax. Uh, this is him a little bit older. Um, but they, um, and it, but we don't know who did it. And for 50 years, people thought this was real. It wasn't until the 1950s that people went, oh, this is fake. They should have known it back. It's kind of like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and those fairies. He should have known, but they wanted, that's the thing, they wanted to believe this. And uh, this is something I talk about in my critical thinking class, is when you want to believe something, you ignore evidence. And, and this is a good example. So even though I love science, science is just a method, and it can be, it can be abused very easily. And if you ever get, I haven't got, I haven't actually been to this place, I keep meaning to go, but there is actually a pub in Piltdown, known as the Piltman Down Pub. So, uh, again, you know, these ideas tie back in with things like the white man's burden. We know since we're superior to everybody else, we have to, as Teddy Roosevelt said, who I like, I always like Teddy Roosevelt, but he was, he believed in these ideas too. And he said, we have to help our brown little brothers. And again, this always portraying these other peoples as almost, as not only primitive, but almost like children. And they have to be helped to civilization. So, um, so let's look, let's kind of get to the heart of this now. We're almost, we're at towards the end now, finally. Um, let's go back to Africa. This is, you know, the new imperialism. So this is an area known as the Congo. I think today is known as the Republic of Congo. And the right beside is the Democratic Republic of Congo. So this is one of these, uh, something happened in the Congo that, is almost completely unknown by most people today. And it's one of the worst things that has ever happened. Congo uh, is full of incredible wealth, uh, gold and diamonds and precious metals, but it was also the site of one of the worst holocausts of all time. And, and, and I mean, it, it, it's, 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 it's very bad. And it's, it's, it's fascinating that we talk about um, what happened in the 1940s and we should, you know, but a lot of people don't realize what happened here. And, and I think it's because it's Africa. Even today, I think there is still this bias, like, ah, oh, that's just Africa. It doesn't matter what happened there. Um, anyway, so um, this is how big the Congo was. I mean, just to give you a sense, I mean, it's, it's, it's a th over a third of the size of the continental United States today. So at one time it was known as the Belgian 
Congo and the nation of Belgium controlled it. In fact, it wasn't even just controlled by the country. It was actually controlled by the king, King Leopold II. He literally owned the Congo, meaning he owned the people of the Congo. Now, what's interesting about Leopold II is that he was, you know, publicly he was known as this guy who did a lot of humanitarian stuff and he, he ran a lot of charities and he kept saying we need to civilize africa we need to help africa out we need to bring them up to to our level and people are like yeah this guy's really good guy and he's absolutely right um and in fact he called together something known as the berlin conference in 1884 where european nations and by the way the u.s was part of this as well um to talk about well, what are we going to do about africa how are we going to help the continent of africa you know what we all should go in and and take over parts of africa we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll do our white man's burden and help them out really what they're talking about is how are we going to carve up africa and so they did, they kind of got together in all these nations, again, in a very civilized way, said, okay, you'll take this part of Africa, we'll take that part of Africa, this country will get that part of Africa, and we'll give Leopold II the Congo, which he already controls, we'll let him have the Congo. So this conference, 1884, is what began what we now call the scramble for Africa. And of course, now you have Cook's uh, and pastures, vaccinations that are helping them out. Uh, you have these ideas of savagery and barbarism, you know, these ideas of Darwin. And I mean, all of this, uh, hopefully you're seeing, uh, as we're going kind of all over the place here, it's all starting to tie in together with Africa. So as I've shown you before, I mean, except for Ethiopia and Liberia, all of Africa at some point eventually is carved up between these European nations. So 14 nations and the U.S. recognize that Leopold owns Congo, that it's his. So one of the things that they would say about much of Africa, including the Congo, is that these are where savages is. These are cannibals. And remember, we talked about the term cannibal, the, the, the you know, idea of people eating other people. Uh, in 1979, there was a book called The Myth of Cannibalism by a guy named Ahrens, an anthropologist, that pretty much proved that there is actually very, very little actual cannibalism in the world. But cannibalism has always been a sign of savagery. So uh, when you don't like a group or you want to take over a group, you call them cannibals or headhunters. And there is you know, some cultures that really do headhunting. In other words, people die and they take their heads and they take the bones out and they take the brains out and all, all that's left is the skin and then they shrink the skin to these little mini heads and then you stuff them with like, you know, sand or something. Uh, most people did this to their ancestors. Uh, and there is one group that did this to their enemies, uh, but it, it never was really done that much. And it was they never went out, we're going to cut up a bunch of heads. It would be a byproduct of war, for instance. And so it became very common for people to uh, explorers to go to Africa and South America looking for these, if you will, products, uh, these souvenirs of these headhunters. And in many places, museums would have these heads. And, and in fact, a lot of major museums still have these shrunken heads. Uh, there's a guy named Jameson who ran the Jameson Whiskey Company in Ireland. He wanted this, he was one of the people that went to Africa and um, looking for headhunters. And he also wanted to see cannibalism. So there is a story that we don't think is real today that, that Jameson actually bought a young girl and gave her to a village and sat there and watched them eat her. Um, and it was, again, reported in lots of newspapers. Again, today, most people don't think it actually happened. But, and this is what's supposed to have been happening here. They're actually eating this young girl while he's watching them. And some stories even say he even tasted it. Um, but this idea of looking upon these other people as savages and then and then almost exploiting them and, and we see this in museums we see this in old movies but also as a, an excuse that we need to take these people over they can't they can't be trusted on their own um and but a lot of other people were writing books like henry stanley um you know this is book in darkest africa it's dark not only is dark-skinned people but they're dark in their nature and you know we need to help these people out um, by the way, most of these uh, heads are fakes. Uh, most of them are actually monkey heads, and some are totally fake. And so museums all over the world actually have a bunch of monkey heads that they argue 
are uh, human heads. So it is very much, uh, to a large degree, a European fantasy. Um, but at the same time, the myth of the headhunters is what justified empire. And so, um, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of a weird little side note, but it actually is like, oh, those people, they're cannibals and headhunters. We have to take them over. It's for their own good. We got to stop their, their uh, in, you know, uncivilized behavior. So back to Congo. Uh, again, King Leopold literally owned it, even though it was called the Free State of Congo. It was anything but free. Um, and again, he used them as slaves to... Um, to extract as many goods as they could to make him richer. Uh, even in the United States, there was in, a, in a, the Bronx Zoo in New York, they had a guy named Oda Benga, who was a purchased from the Congo. A, a person was literally purchased in 1905 and installed at the Bronx Zoo and held in the monkey house as a zoo exhibit. And the NAACP finally freed him and then eventually shot himself to death. Um, but the fact that they were able to buy him was because they could buy them from the Congo. Basically, it's the slave trade come back. Um, so the atrocities here are, are, are really quite unbelievable. They, they worked these people to death, including children. Uh, if they didn't work hard enough, their hands would cut off, their arms were cut off. And you can see photographs. This is from an expose showing the, the direct effects of this. And again, see, this person didn't work hard, so we cut their hand off. And again, it makes you think, well, who is the savage here? Is it that person with no hand, or is it the person who cut his hand off? By 1906, 10 million people in the Congo died from these conditions or were outright killed. And again, these are people that would not have died otherwise. I mean, these are directly because of the slave trade. And, and, and the conditions, but most of them were actually killed in one way or another. If you look at uh, the atrocities done by various leaders, uh, without a doubt, the worst, of course, is Mao Zedong. Uh, almost 80 million people died under him. Then, of course, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, but just under Hitler and just barely under Hitler is King Leopold of Belgium. And he's almost nobody knows about him today. And it's really quite shocking that we don't know about him today. And again, I think it's because uh, the others took place in Asia and Europe, his took place in Africa. And people still to this day don't pay attention to Africa like they should. Eventually people like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, learn what's going on here and they begin to expose it. Uh, Joseph Conrad, some of you may have had to read this in high school. I know I did, The Heart of Darkness, which it's kind of racist in itself, but it's an expose about the darkness of what's going on in the Congo. Um, it, it is a criticism of what's going on in the Congo. And some of you may have seen the movie Apocalypse Now, which is also based on this novel. But eventually, uh, King Leopold was removed from controlling this, and the, the nation of Belgium was uh, took over and it did get a little bit better but even there there were still a lot of atrocities even after king leopold was removed so in other words uh, when you look at imperialism from the european viewpoint um there is it, it is very dark you know it's, there's ideas of race and exploitation and all this kind of come together but at the same time, there is uh, some good that do come out of this. And, and not all empires were created the same. Um, you know, the British Empire could be cruel, but it was nothing, for instance, like the German Empire, which was much, much worse. Or, or obviously King Leopold. I mean, um, I, 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 I'll have a clip on Georgia View next to this lecture from a Monty Python movie called Life of Brian. It has a little, it's a little scene uh, talking about the Roman Empire, and it's a comedy scene, but it, you know, it starts out where they say, what did the Romans ever do for us? And then they name all these great things that the Romans did for them. And we have to remind ourselves that um, as bad as these empires were, there were some elements that actually were positive. Um, you know, a lot of these I mean, lifespan does improve in Asia and Africa, not the Congo, but everywhere else. We do see lifespan improve. Um, they do start to get vaccinations. We do see railroads being added to Africa. We see new technologies showing up. Um, France, for instance, banned witch doctors. 
1904, you see the first national health service in Africa. Uh, 1905, under the French area, uh, they get fr free health care. Um, they, they, got, they got smallpox vaccinations. So there were indeed um, some real benefits to these people. And again, it is, as so much of history, it's a combination of negative and positive. And I think Germany is a good example of this. Uh, Southwest Africa. Today, it is known as Namibia, uh, but, but when under German control, you had South Africa, uh, you know, then you have Southwest Africa, and this was the part that was under German control. This is the modern nation today. And again, it is a very developed nation of millions of people, huge cities. But the way Germans portrayed it in the late 1800s was that it was full of barbarians and savages who would, did, wanted nothing more than to steal from white men and rape and kill white women. And many German publications portrayed the people here. And who were these people? They were the Nama and Herero people, the people that Francis Galton used as his example of why we need eugenics. Um, well, in 1904, the Nama and Herrero people were tired of being exploited, and they decided to rise up and, and fight, just like American colonists did. They wanted an independent nation. And this was their leader, who was trained at West Point. He was a real military leader. He, you know, In other words, these were not the savages that, that the movies would have portrayed or the novels would have portrayed at the time. They were civilized people with a rich, long history who just simply wanted to be independent and wouldn't be seen as another nation. Well, a Kaiser, which is German, it comes from the word Caesar, but it's German for emperor, Wilhelm II, somebody we'll be talking about with World War I, he issued extermination orders. They plugged up all the springs they cut off food supplies from the people and anybody they could grab, they would exterminate. So they not only were they starving them, but they were rounding up anybody they could grab, loading them up on trains and ships and literally sending them to death camps. So when we talk about Hitler and we talk about the concentration camps of the 1940s, like Auschwitz, which this year, 2020, is the 75th anniversary of the freeing of those concentration camps. Um, those concentration camps did not begin in 1940. Uh, Germany already had a history of doing this. Hitler didn't invent these ideas. He was... he. He was taking ideas that already existed and was using them. Genocide, which is the purposeful killing of a group based on their race or, or ethnicity. Uh, we were seeing real true genocide. Some people like to say that Native Americans were victims of genocide. I, I'm not one. We treated Native Americans horribly here. We did not see death camps. We don't really see genocide until the 20th century. This is the beginning of genocide. So again, it's the purposeful cleansing of a race or ethnicity, not just removing, but literally wiping them out. And of course, they're using ideas of eugenics to back this up. Um, so they had five death camps. Uh, Herrero, uh, again, you can see about 65,000 Herrero were killed in just a few years. Uh, over 50% of the Nama were executed during this period. Now, again, World War II, we see you know millions executed. So again, the, the, the scale of that is so much more but the basic process is the same. And, and again, there are a lot of images that do look a lot like what you would see during World War II. One of the things that's the most disturbing is that uh, a lot of um, science was done at these camps. And um, in fact, throughout the world, a lot of bones that were uh, used in science classes, you know, skeletons were actually the, from these death camps. Um, and they were using the bodies to study human anatomy. And in fact, um, this is a, you know, a head that, that, that would be mounted in a museum. They would often get the prisoners to scrape out the brains of their fellow prisoners after they died so they could mount them and send these to museums and medical facilities. This is, again, another one that was sent out from Hottentot is basically a word that Germans use to describe these savages. 
eventually uh, what happened here was revealed and uh, there were there was a huge outcry against this and this was later considered um, a war crime so um, by uh, 1913 Europe the West controls 60 percent of the physical world and over 80 percent of the population um, and its economic output um, so in 1913, the right before World War I, the West has taken over most of the world. World War I is going to change that. And that's after our next exam. This will be our last lecture before the exam. After that, we'll get into World War I and then the Second World War. All right, uh, you survived it. That was a very, very long lecture. Hopefully you paused it a bunch of times as, you were, <laughs> as I was going through. Uh, but you made it to the end. Thank you, guys.